Good evening. Um, here we are at Davis Media Access in Davis, California, and our program is On the Wire. My name is Mark Graham. I'm the host for this program. Our guest is Mr. Tom Bleis, and tonight we're going to be talking about the global energy revolution. So hold on to your seats. There's going to be a lot of interesting, fun information here. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, I want to start out by showing our audience the book that you've just written. It was published last fall called Prescription for the Planet. And if we could cut to that slide, people will get a close-up view of this book. Um, now, this book, do you want to briefly tell us what's the uh, subject of your book, Tom? Well, essentially, the, um, the book describes three little-known technologies that uh, taken together and utilized in the way that's proposed in the book can actually lead the whole planet to a post-scarcity uh, situation where everyone on the planet would have ample, even abundant energy and uh, utilize the resources in such a way that um, the standard of living for everyone on the planet could be elevated without uh, depleting the resources. because. So many times people say, well, if, if everybody on the planet wanted to have the lifestyle of an American or a European, we'd need three or four Earths or just simply aren't enough resources. Um, the reason that there aren't enough resources is because of the bad way we use the resources and just throw them away. Um, and using these technologies, we would be able to recycle virtually everything and provide all the energy that everyone needs. Wow, now that sounds like a heck of a promise. A heck of a promise you've made to us. So I was thinking about electricity today. And I was thinking, to my understanding, here's the way it works. When I go to turn on the light switch, the lights come on. So the system works in some sense of the word. All right, we generate some air pollution, but that's, that's part of life. We've been doing it like this for a long time. As long as there's more, more coal in the ground, why don't we just keep mining it, and burning it to make electricity, and what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is global warming, for starters, and, and not just global warming. I mean, there are some people that don't believe in global warming, um, although I, I believe that the, the proof is almost irrefutable. I think uh, slide two would probably uh, give some idea of, of the proof behind global warming. We are going to um, get to that soon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even if you don't believe in global warming, that it's a problem, uh, it's, it's a fact that uh, there's a tremendous amount of pollution generated by coal. There's about oh, $160 billion a year is lost just because of coal pollution, deaths, uh, premature deaths due to coal. Uh, that's just in the United States. China is way worse than the United States. Um, and so if you, if you, don't believe in global warming, fine, but if you like clean air, that's a perfectly good reason to pursue the policies in this book and to leave the coal in the ground. Mm -hmm. All right, um, smokestacks. <clears throat> Our second slide gives us one little shot of some smokestacks uh, at a coal-fired energy plant. And according to the notes I've got here, it looks like there are about 500 coal-fired power plants in the United States. That's a huge amount. I mean, it averages out, what, to 10 per state, and over 100 more that are owned by industry, so we're up to 600. I th seem to remember hearing that in China they're building one more new coal power plant every week. Is that it? Uh, at least one a week. At some, least one a week. Some weeks they open two. Um, China has such a tremendous problem with pollution now. Seven of the 10 most polluted cities in the world are located in China. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pollution from China mingles with the pollution from the rest of Southeast Asia to form a brown cloud called the Asian brown cloud by some people mm -hmm. that stretches from Afghanistan to Japan. 
Um, and a lot of that pollution ends up coming all the way across the Pacific and, and drops in the United States. Uh, the fact is that no matter what we do in the United States, we can't pretend that the issue of pollution or the issue of global warming is a United States issue. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't call it U.S. warming. <clears throat> There's a reason for that. Um, and so a lot of the times when people are talking about what are we going to do about global warming and energy, they have a very myopic view. They say, well, okay, <coughs> if we, and then they lay out some plan for what the United States has to do, but it wouldn't matter if the U.S. went to zero carbon emissions today. As long as we don't have China, India, and the rest of the world on board, we're in a world of hurt. So, uh, so we have to have solutions that actually are going to work as opposed to solutions that people dream might work mm -hmm. or technologies that somebody is supposed to invent sometime really quick in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we need uh, solutions that are going to be applicable to the entire planet, and that's what uh, Prescription for the Planet is all about. So we're, all right, we're aiming for the whole world to find a cleaner way to produce electricity. The whole shebang. Not just a cleaner way, uh, an absolutely clean way, so that clean. our greenhouse gas emissions... Uh, the targets for you know the Kyoto Protocol and and son of Kyoto and grandson of Kyoto, uh, they call for a reduction of emissions for below 1990 levels, from around anywhere from 20 to 50 to even 80 percent. Uh, what I'm aiming for is 100 percent, mm -hmm. and hopefully then also using um, our power systems to actually reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is so much higher than it was pre-industrial that uh, the danger is global warming is going to continue to happen because carbon dioxide is so persistent in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we actually have to not only stop it, we have to turn it around. And anybody that tells you that we should only get 50% or 70% or whatever, um, they're not getting us where we have to be. It, it seems that would just be um, accepting a plan where we continue to add to, to the problem, only slower. Yeah, a bit slower. But the thing is, we reach tipping points, and then and then it becomes a, a per self perpetuating cycle. Like mm -hmm. now, they're finding that the tundra is melting and releasing huge amounts of methane, which is 20 times worse as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last quite as long in the atmosphere. But once it breaks down in the atmosphere, it breaks down into carbon dioxide, which then lasts almost a thousand years. So um, unless we can both stop it and find a way to reverse it, we're probably in deep trouble. We're almost 100 parts per million. We're at about 380, 385 parts per billion, or parts per million uh, carbon dioxide right now. Hmm. Pre-industrial was about 280. Wow. So, and uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeing our glaciers melting, our polar ice cap melting, and a lot of the problems associated with strange weather patterns. All right, so we're looking at a global problem and a global solution. Now, one other thing that happens with coal, recently there was a big spill near in Tennessee of coal ash, which I didn't really know about until I heard this. But apparently, after you burn the coal in a power plant, you end up with ash, and the good folks that run these power plants put them in various places with the hopes that they'll sit there and never leak or spill or you know come running down the river. Um, the next slide shows us what the result of uh, this, one of these coal ash spills look like. It's a pretty nasty thing. Can you give us some idea of the, the size of the, the problem, the size of the spill that they had in Tennessee? Um, I don't actually know the size. Okay. I, I, I know that it, uh, it poured into the river and, um, and it, it, it actually made its way into the Clinch River, which was rather ironic because um, the Clinch River uh, had a nuclear power plant that was being built on it that was supposed to be the model for how we can eliminate coal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was shut down <laughs> for political reasons. So, you know, now here we go. It, it kind of came back uh, in a very um, aptly ironic way to bite us. And what were they going to burn in that power plant? That was going to be a, a fast breeder reactor, oh. uh, similar to the ones, uh, not exactly the same,